One. So we are live. We're going to let some people jump on. How are you doing tonight, Kevin? I am spectacular as always, Mystery Eater. That is terrific. And how are you doing tonight, Paul? <laughs> doing good. Good to that be here. Is, that is awesome. Thank you for being on the show. And how are you doing tonight, Thomas? I'm doing well. Like I said, I'm in a hotel in Nashville. Just kicking that back, is. waiting for another day tomorrow. Are you doing another class tomorrow? I'm not. Uh, I'm doing private mentoring this week. So I'm uh, oh, wow. here. I was out. We did uh, some color repair work on wool carpet. We're, uh, we did some tile and grout cleaning. We did some carpet cleaning. We did some upholstery cleaning. And I'm um, going out tomorrow doing more of the same. That is awesome. So let's go ahead and start the show. So I'd like to thank everyone for jumping on board tonight for the Teacher's Lounge. And I would like to ask you to do me a favor. Um, go out there and be in service of others. We're in service of you tonight. And thank those that are in service of others. Remember, when somebody's trying to help us out each and every day to make sure that we show um, thank grace. You, thank you, Tim. You're welcome, Kevin, and thank you for being on tonight. So before we let the love fest begin too much, let's go ahead and have our first what would you do? All right. So this guy wanted to talk about um, winterizing and he tagged his equipment. Now, I am fortunate. I have a heated area. I'm really fortunate. Um, but I haven't always had any heat in the area. And I was thinking it would be a good place for all of us to share our little ticks, tips and tricks that we found out through the years. And we have a really unique circumstance with a man that washes windows. So it doesn't always just apply to carpet cleaning equipment. It applies to everything we have to win, um, winterize. So I was wondering if we could start out tonight with Thomas. Thomas, what's your take on winterization? Well, you either spend a few hundred dollars, buy the right cords and the right tools, or you spend thousands of dollars fixing your freeze. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you 10 amp cords is the only way to go. Uh, I like the, uh, wireless infrared monitors that you put in your vehicle and it sends the information back to your home so you can mm -hmm. sit in your nice warm home and see the temperature inside your vehicle remember separate 20 amp breakers for each heater if you don't do that it's a recipe for disaster oh absolutely i agree that those are great tips and you know sometimes you have no choice but to leave leave an electric heater in i think i know paul's suggestion because he lives where it's so cold could you practically winterize every night, Paul? Well, when I had a truck mount, uh, I had a, a garage. It wasn't heated, so to speak, but I, I put a heater in there and I, I kept the garage at a, tried to keep it at about 45. And then I had a separate heater electric inside the van and I tried to keep that uh, like 60. And uh, by having, you know, both, uh, I if one failed, I, I still wasn't going to hit freezing. And then uh, we still winterize the lines uh, at times because, you know, as soon as we leave that heated garage, we're out in the cold. And, um, you know, uh, that could be a problem in itself. So uh, sometimes we did, you know, run and I freeze through the solution lines. Uh, but most of the time, I relied on my heaters uh, to, to do the job for me. Yeah, I, I've had to do the same for many years. Um, Kevin, as a window washer, is there anything that would be – because a lot of these guys that watch the show are looking into expanding their business. And, um, you know, window washing is kind of one of your expertise. Um, kind kinda. of? Special. It's okay, kinda. It's magic water. You're a magic water boy. I mean, my goodness. Like – if Adam Sandler was slightly less cool and grew a goatee, he would be a little bit less better of a water boy than you. You know, I'm not even <laughs> sure how to take that. 
So you know, I don't even know where personal. you're going with it. That that, that one's well, it's, like it's kind of. I think Beaker's brain there. froze up. Does anybody see I, that? Now? There's there's similarities between you and you know the water boy. Um, just um, water boy. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you have to do for all your magic water? Can what happens if the eye water does freeze? I mean, that's one question these guys may have. Well, just because it's magic doesn't mean it has a lower freezing point. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and with the systems that we're running. So I have two window systems. One is a $5,100 system. One's a $3,500 system. And it'll, it'll pop the lines. It'll crack the housings. So, uh, you know, the, the one thing about window cleaning is typically after we get to freezing temps during the day, mm-hmm. uh, we're just going to pull the stuff out. Uh, I park it in the garage and then I just run water through it every every week or two. Um, but like for the next two weeks, where we're at, uh, next week, we're going to have temperatures at night in the 20s. And we're going to have them in the 40s during the day. So we're still, we're still doing windows for at least a week or if not two into freezing temps. So I park the electric heater in the back of the truck. I do have a garage, but... Right now, the power washing trailer with both my big power washers are sitting in there. So we'll move that over so that we can have extra room. But, you know, I'm a nice guy and I like to let the wife park in the garage so she can get in a warm vehicle in the morning. So I just put a heater in the back of the truck, keep everything warm. It's just got to stay above 32 degrees. It just Mm -hmm. can't freeze. Um, But we have had situations where we're driving, you know, you say an hour to a job and we have portable, you know, the portables and stuff in there. You got to mm-hmm. drain all the water out really, really you well attention. And, and make sure that either you're putting some antifreeze in there, uh, especially for the pumps. Cause the, the lines you can drain out pretty well, but, um, run, you know, run a little antifreeze, but then you got to make sure you flush that out before you start throwing that on any, any carpet. So, Absolutely. you know, it can, it could be, a a little bit of thing, but I do like the tagging. You know, if you're gonna, mm-hmm. some of us, we just got so much stuff. If you, oh man, I don't know how many times I look at something and go, Did I do that? Um, can't remember. I found 37 quick disconnects, all Parker. <laughs> I've ordered them oh. every time. I, I just like it, it's like I had them on repeat, they just kept coming and. All different sizes. I have a total of thirty-seven, and you know those tags can save your butt. Um, that's all there is to it. You know, without without paying attention, you can definitely get yourself in trouble. I thought that was a great t- tip um, for the winterization. Um, you don't want to, you know, lose track of what you've taken care of for the winter and what you haven't. Um, so I, th- I think it is actually time for Kevin. Um, what time is it, do you think? I think it might be time. It's time for the harder truth, buddy. It's a harder truth. Oh, As my Christian goodness. Is it, gonna be, is it going to be brutal? Well, is we missed a brutal? week. We so did I miss got a, a couple week. messages this week. And it's like, is it going to be harder truth? Is it going to be like double hard between a rock and a hard place truth? Well, it's going to have to be, I think, right? I think so. It's time for the hard truth, guys. I'm just going to go right into it. Don't be greedy. I see a lot of people that want that talk about raise your price, raise your price, raise your price. And I understand that in business, we have to make sure that we are, have good profit margins. But do you have to have stupid profit margins? At what point do you start taking advantage of your customers? I see people post online where they're talking about, I made $250 an hour today to clean carpet, to clean windows. You made $250 an hour. You're screwing someone. If that shoe was on the other foot, you would be livid. And ironically, these are the same idiots that are complaining that they did the math and the chemical is too expensive because 
Oh my God, it's 35 cents a diluted gallon. Seriously? Don't be greedy. And here's here's where you're going to end up really regretting this if you decide that a few extra dollars on the ticket is more important to you than your customer's loyalty. For those of us that went through downturns like 2008, you think that's bad now? We're just kind of seeing some of the downturn ticks happening. There was a lot of people that lost their business in 2008. Those of us that survived this and flourished, one of the keys was we were honest and we were good to our customers no matter what. You can make good money. There's nothing wrong with making good money. And don't come at me with this. Well, I've done, I've taken 20 years to learn how to do it in an hour. Yeah, okay. If your customer is paying less for an electrician or a plumber to come to their house than their carpet cleaner, you think there's, they're too dumb to do the math? At some point, they're going to do the math. Don't screw people over. That's when you lose customers. They may have been that satisfied customer that we talked about in the one episode. Satisfied customer. You want a satisfied customer? No, because they're worthless. You want a loyal customer. Do your job costing. How much money are you making? Are you making 70% gross profit? You're making really good money. You don't need to increase their price just because everybody's telling you to increase their price. Be honest. Give the customer value. What they're paying and the value they're receiving has to balance. When that balance goes out of whack, you're going to lose a customer. And guess who's going to come pick them up? The people that were honest with their customers and they charge a fair rate. Now, again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be compensated adequately for what you do. That's an absolute truth. We have to do that when we're in business for ourselves. Don't get greedy. Don't throw 15 or 20 extra bucks on there because you can. When the going gets tough, here's something you ought to try. If the if the economy takes a downturn and everybody starts hurting, improve your efficiency. Be smarter. Be better. And go to your customers and say, you know, we're in, we know, we know everybody's struggling right now. Uh, your bill is fifteen dollars less. This service. You want to talk about a loyal customer? That's the one that's going to be loyal. And the next time you have to increase the price, you're probably not going to blink twice. Don't be greedy. Give good value. Get customer loyalty, and be honest with what you're doing. You don't. We're not doing anything that is going to save a life here. Okay. Let's just, let's be honest. Dirty windows. There's, there's no statistics showing that you're going to live longer if you have clean windows or if your carpet's clean. Yeah. There's some health benefits to it, but let's, let's, let's just cut to brass tacks. People can do without our service. Be honest, get customers that are loyal to you. And when things start to take a downturn, you'll survive it. You'll come out on the top at the end, and that's when your business will thrive. And that's the truth. Excellent job, Kevin. I 100% agree with you when it comes to this subject. Now, um, Well, I'm glad one person will. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's funny because I have incredible margins on what we take in per hour for our business. We, we maintain a high profit rate. But there is times where it is it, it just gets wrong, where it's like I could take advantage of a situation, yet you choose not to. Yeah, absolutely. And we had that, that come up this year where we got done with a job and the customer was so happy. Mm -hmm. I had been the, the work site unseen. It was a construction clean on windows. And she was so happy with the work and so ecstatic how the building was looked when we got done. She said, mm -hmm. 
I am so happy with this. You can charge me whatever you want. Right. And double the price. I I added a little bit. I made a little bit more money, but I was still fair. You have to maintain fairness. And we have one um, statement right here. This is from TJ Lucy. He's, um, he brings up that plumbers. Oh shit. They um, don't. (laughs) <laughs> I've been on a you few want, plumber's trucks that have you wanna, way over a hundred. Yeah. So I got a buddy that was just at my mom's house today for a broken pipe. You want to, you don't think he's got a hundred thousand dollars in that truck and it, yeah, everything it can be that's pretty sitting crazy. in there and their education. It can take seven years to learn how to be a plumber. Yeah, exactly. I mean the apprenticeship program alone. And it's not that I think it's a bad viewpoint. Yes. We have to make incredible profits, but I think we have to glean ourselves like from the examples um, Paul, I'm sure you remember the insurance scandals that like serve pro and some of these huge conglomerates. And I'm not saying it as a corporate entity. I'm saying as individuals within that company. Um, I'm sure you've been aware of where people have just totally taken advantage of insurance companies and customers just because they could. Yep. Well, we, we were involved. We've been involved in legal cases uh, because of that. And I've been subpoenaed and I've done uh Unfortunately, I had to do work with the, you know, the attorney general in the state of Michigan. So, you know, I've been involved in a couple of those things where uh, we're a subcontractor and um, what they end up billing uh, the insurance and the customer uh, has no reflection on what the, uh, the actual work being done. They just bill what they thought they could get away with. Mm-hmm. And so it makes it very uncomfortable to work with people like that. And then I've seen it on the flip side where I'm working with some property owner or homeowner or business owner and they want to pad the bill with everything. And they want me to uh, support them in their effort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, defrauding the insurance company or, or the or, or another contractor. And so you go like, man, how do these guys survive in business when they're they're outright crooks? And so it's very difficult sometimes because you, you don't see it coming and all of a sudden you're in the middle of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, not being greedy is really it's just a motherhood. It's it's not even mm-hmm. like a good idea or, or a good business principle. It's just the way that we should all be uh, if, you know, we should treat each other with, uh, you know, some amount of uh, brotherhood so that we don't steal from one another. It's just uh, mm-hmm. it's just something. Yeah, that, that, and that's the point. It's like if, if the shoe was on the other foot, if, if, if that was you paying the money and you did the math and somebody came out to do something that you could do yourself if you absolutely had to. Like, I, I, I'm not going to try to replumb my house. I'm not going to try to fix a water leak. That's why I had my buddy come out today and fix the water line because I didn't want to mess with it. I don't care what that costs because I can't do it. If there's again, if the shoe was on the other foot, it's something you could do, and the bill is way over what you would anticipate it being. You don't feel good, and customers mm-hmm. buy with a feeling, right? And they might pay your bill, but again, we're think about customer loyalty. A yeah, loyal I, customer will call you over and over and over, and it doesn't matter what it costs because they trust you. Don't take advantage of that trust. That's my and, main point. And I, yeah. well, I agree with that. And one thing I would like to state is we also don't want to forget that we are a, you know, we are a want type of service. This is such a good statement. You know, there are necessities. We are a want. And being a luxury service does mean that we're already charging because we're already charging a high rate because it is a luxury. We get paid premium compared to like typical, you know, McDonald's worker, for example, we get paid a premium as it is. So we don't want to take advantage of the situation and turn it to a premium to an extortion. So that that's, I think what Kevin was getting across. Yeah. And you can really use good. your equipment and say, well, I've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. Look, I've got in the back of my truck right now, I've probably got $20,000 worth of window cleaning equipment. Mm-hmm. There are people that can go out and do the exact same thing with I'll say a thousand dollars worth of window cleaning equipment. If they're right. willing to climb a ladder mm-hmm. and they want to do everything traditional, they can do the same job with a fraction of the cost. I make up some of that inefficiency. 
that doesn't mean because I have twenty thousand dollars in the back of my truck and they have a thousand dollars in the back of theirs that I can charge twenty times more. That's not how that works. No, it's just not. It's just not. So we better actually move on. We could probably talk about this all night. It is time for our next. Go, what would you I do? Do this Aaron? all night long, buddy. All night long. I know you're just a you're just a dog ready to chew. All right, I love this one. And when I saw it, it made me think of um, Thomas and Paul and the, the S100. So I looked into this a little bit. And I have to say something that will make Paul pretty happy. You have to groom, groom carpet, guys. It is part of finishing the job. The S100 standard, it, 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 it does. it's pretty clear on some of these manufacturers. If the carpet is cleaned, you must groom the carpet. Um, and there's an issue that is, if there's an issue, there has to have been an issue. And I think Paul actually froze up. Did Paul freeze up? No, no, I'm just, uh, waiting just, for your words of wisdom. Tell. Oh, cause you're, I'm saying you're right. So that way they're wise. I yeah. See he him. was probably dumbfounded because he's like, so huh? <laughs> now that being said, the, the carpet jobs where my customers don't care about the or don't have a warranty and i choose to leave shark teeth i will but um yeah this is a pretty true statement guys i mean you can't get around it what carpet mills want they want and there is standards that you have to maintain um paul okay so um i know this isn't a popular opinion but uh, you know we mainly teach oriental rug washing and we talk about grooming as being a very important uh, part of it. Uh, it's uh, We spend a lot of time uh, talking about pile lay, pile direction, secondary pile lay, uh, uh, and how to get the, uh, the right look, uh, the, very, uh, the varieties of brooms, rakes, combs, brushes uh, that we uh, carry and use uh, varying from rug to rug. Well, frankly, um, carpeting looks so much better. I see pictures all the time, and I, and, and I say, if that was my house, I tell a guy I'm not paying them. You know, my my carpet doesn't look like what it did when it was installed. You know, I want it to look nice. I don't want it to look like pizza pies and shark's teeth. But then I have customers too that are carpet cleaners all day long. You know, seven days a week. And they flat out tell me, we got customers that love the uh, diamond pattern, the shark teeth. And mm -hmm. if we don't do it, that they don't want to pay us because <laughs> we didn't clean the carpet. So I know I know it's opinion. Uh, so I will basically compromise and say, you know, you should do what your customer uh, meet their expectations, maybe uh, discuss it. But I'll tell you, a lot of upholstery, a lot of carpeting and certainly every rug as far as i'm concerned unless it's a tapestry flat weave grooming does a great deal to improve not only its appearance but also the performance of the cleaning it speeds drying mm -hmm. uh, it deals with um, texture issues uh, you can't clean a silk rug yeah, grooming it you you have a it's very very difficult to clean a rayon rug without grooming it. I think that grooming pretty much would groom any rayon rug if you don't properly groom it. I so, agree. So I, I'm kind of pro-grooming. Uh, I know it's in the standards, and if we're going to meet or exceed industry standards, then we should at least offer uh, to do it for a customer. Uh, if you're putting down fiber protector, and you're charging appropriately for that fiber protector, then absolutely uh, it needs to be groomed in uh, to make sure that the application of the um, fiber protectant is uh, worked into the pile somewhat and, and make the carpet look good. Um, I might make the same case for deodorizer. You know, we, mm -hmm. re we really have to make physical contact. What better way to do that than with agitation? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but again, I know that's not always the case. I remember back when we used to wax floors way, way back that uh, a lot of the floor machine guys put a nice swirl pattern 
in their to their carnuba uh, waxed dance floors. And when you came on the dance floor, it was a beautiful wax job. And then when you danced on it, you you scarred it all up, and then they go back and reapply those <laughs> swirl marks. Well, so yeah. you know you can yeah, shampoo. Some customers <laughs> wanted the swirl marks, so they didn't think the floor was done right. Yeah, so yep. I so, so I, I know it goes both ways, but but I, uh, you know, I am pro grooming. Yeah, well, that that's a good thing because some of the I'm manufacturers, I actually, too. they they said you had to. I know you're into grooming. You always look so good. I mean, just next thing you know, you'll be caught drinking a white claw on the beach. Hey, hey, Ron, I think he, he's got that picture. He ought to show everybody. He, he one day may show the picture. Who knows? Um, Josh, got proof. how are you doing tonight? I'd like to welcome you on board tonight. Doing good. I apologize. I was uh, up last night cleaning a bowling alley till 7 a.m. So I did yeah. 12,000 square feet last you night. You didn't strike oh, out, like... did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I, I think he hit a strike on that one. Maybe it was a spare. Maybe he had. Did he have any spare time? I uh, no. I didn't even have spare time for a break, guys. It's, it's bad. <laughs> I, that I definitely struck out on. So, but uh, I try. To, I try to work a split shift when I do bowling alleys. Well, you let's know. not go too deep into that. <laughs> <laughs> I know right where this is heading. It's head towards the gutter. What are you talking about? Everybody's oh. internal filter is about to break down, and you're going to see the truth, you, Kevin Colors. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Perk. <laughs> so, Josh, what's your thoughts on grooming? Well, um, I'm a big fan of Waldo, um, the guy that always. Well, have you have you all been in the Waldo's world? Oh yeah, Wal yeah Waldo the group. man is notorious for being a huge. Grooming, um, he's so That's funny when he model. does it. It's like a grooming snob. I mean, the guy's awesome, dude. He gets on there and he does this whole act where he's taking the broom and he's putting his phone down on the ground, and then he takes his broom and he shoves it in front of the camera, like, "Come on, guys, it's what you're supposed to be doing." And uh, then he <laughs> then he grooms in the car. It's awesome. But um, when I first started. I owned a uh, broom, and um, I need to go buy another one. To be honest with you, but uh, that's cool. I, you know, I, we all we all go through our different phases. I I I was anti Cymex for ever till I bought another Cymex, and I still love my tops equipment. I mean, I love them, but a Cymex machine does not spin an Oriental rug. So it's like, what do I do when I'm shampooing rugs? I use it because it doesn't make them spin on the floor, and I'm always by myself cleaning. But Thomas, um, are, what's your thought on the grooming process? I know you have some strong, not just opinions, but um, from the manufacturer view, viewpoints. Well, you know, most manufacturers recommend the carpet be groomed, especially, now let's get specific, nylon carpet. Because you're actually setting the nap. It's like when a woman puts curlers in her hair, her hair dries with that bounce and resilience. Nylon carpet, if you groom the carpet and let it dry properly, it resets the nap and the resilience of the carpet. And so they really do recommend that you do that for best wear and appearances of the carpet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to complain about it. Well, you know, if you actually look at a shark's tooth, that's part of the carpet's groomed down, part of the nap is groomed up. The part that's Absolutely. down is going to dry slower. It's more likely to wick. It's more likely to have more uh, microbial growth during the drying process. It does not set the nap. So there are a lot of reasons why it should be done in most circumstances. And people say, oh, oh, well, my customer only likes it when they're shark's teeth. Well, that's because some idiot... They didn't know how to clean left shark teeth. And the only way they could tell it was done because they couldn't even get it very clean was to leave shark teeth. Personally, I educate my customer as to why shark teeth are bad and why they should allow me to do a professional job and do it the way the manufacturers recommend to be done, not do a hack job. But, hey, that's just my opinion. And I'm sorry, but I got to say it the way it is. The reality well, it's, is it's, there's your second hard truth of the night. 
boys and <laughs> my girls. Goodness. We went full out Captain Carpet there. My goodness, no shield was for, <laughs> spared on that one. But it's, it is the truth, Thomas. And, you know, tonight we're talking about, you know, we're focusing on personal relevance. Are you relevant if you're not willing to maintain a standard? Well, they're not, if they can't meet the minimum standards, I mean, you're supposed to not. meet or exceed standards. Yeah. If and you so can't personal, even meet them. And then you you somehow think that you're this great guru. Um, I, I bet you didn't write the standards. I bet you haven't done millions and millions of dollars worth of testing like the mills have or anything else. But you think you're capable of having a better answer than. Well, uh, I give yeah. you the Bronx cheer for that because it really doesn't work that way. The reality is the mills spend millions and millions of dollars in research every year. And they've come up with this answer as the best way to get the optimum performance from their products. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it. There's no carpet police that are going to come out and arrest you for not grooming the carpet. But I feel that my customers deserve me to do the best job I physically can. And in order to do that, I have to try to meet or exceed the standards, not fall far short of them. I don't know. Uh, I think I'm going to all... drive over to Tim's house tonight and throw a little siren on top of his Magna Drive van so he can drive there... around and be the carpet <laughs> police. <laughs> You're doing well, it we wrong. better you know, doing it wrong. doesn't get bit by a radioactive spider tonight. Where's your, good where's your rake, wrong. Hargis? How are you doing it wrong? Woo! I drank the word. Fiber alert! Fiber alert! All righty. So it is time for our next What Would You Do, Aaron? Oh, all right this is really good i love this one i love it i love it i love it because i hate one of the things he's talking about with such a not rage filled passion they have their place um will oxidizers such as h2o2 um destroy an enzyme my understanding is the enzymes have electrons therefore they will be destroyed um Paul, can you? I, I don't want to. Uh, gentle. <laughs> I leave the floor to well, Paul. Gentle and within 25, 30 hours or so. Okay. Well, for example, well, just, just a, a point here all molecules and all atoms have electrons. So ju just to kind of answer that point is everything has electrons with with the exception possibly of hydrogen in the core of a star uh, can be just a proton. But pretty much if, if it's not at a billion degrees, it's going to have a electron also, or maybe two or three. So uh, we'll just address that. I think the big confusion comes with the word enzyme and the word bacteria, there's a little confusion. I think we interchangeably use them without thinking about it sometimes. And so, you know, not to split hairs too much, but an enzyme is, is basically a catalyst and uh, it, it helps a chemical reaction. And it is a non-living thing. It is a, it is a chemical, okay? But enzymes are made by living things mainly bacteria. So when we start talking about enzyme, we're almost always inferring that there's a living entity associated with it, usually in a, a bacteria. But it, even we make enzymes. If you start thinking about eating just a wonderful steak, unless you're a vegetarian, uh, you know, a, a nice salad, uh, and your mouth starts to water, that's you manufacturing enzymes to digest those proteins or, or those uh, those uh, vegetables. So th that's where there's a little confusion. Oxidation is going to kill single cell organisms quite easily. So again, making an assumption here that we're talking about bacteria, almost certainly any oxidizer, and for that matter, any reducing agent is going to disrupt the chemistry of that single cell and is going to 
you know, end its life. Uh, oxidation also affects the cell wall and easily destroys most single cell organisms. Now, when we get the things more complex, then, you know, maybe it's a little harder to kill things, uh, but almost certainly, uh, I think the intent of this question is, you know, is, is hydrogen peroxide going to destroy uh, the things that cause odor uh, or rotten smell or decay uh, or putrid? The answer is, yeah, it probably will, will, will do that. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly what I was thinking that you would say, and um, exactly what I was thinking too. Now, a lot of questions when it comes to enzymes and heat. Um, some enzymes can hold up to um, pretty incredible heat. They can get up to about 180, 190 before they start breaking down. Um, and other enzymes that are like naturally occurring, otherwise the rem remnants left behind behind bacterium, like Paul was discussing that, you know, that's how that works. Those enzymes don't like much heat at all. Um, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, that was brought up. I, this is a, a week or two old, so I kind of forgot. Yeah. But somebody brought up about synthetic enzymes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm only familiar with one, uh, cyclodextrin, uh, which is kind of more of an enzyme mimic than it is a real enzyme. Um, and, and, you know, we, we have, that's, a the active ingredient in Febreze, uh, product and it, it is a, an effective deodorizer. Uh, but the only reason I'm aware of it is because it does attack the wool fiber itself. And, um, if you spray Febreze on, uh, hair or wool or other protein materials, uh, it will, you know, it will destroy that material. So uh, that that would be the only synthetic uh, product that I'm really aware of. And, and of course, it's based on on sugar, so it's kind of a natural mimic uh, of a natural product. But almost all enzymes are going to be natural because mm -hmm. they're so easy to get, and and enzymes are extremely abundant on on Earth. They're ju they're just everywhere. Anything that's alive. Every living cell, no matter what it is, whether it's a plant, an insect, an animal, a microorganism, creates enzymes. So, so yeah. yes, that's a living thing. So enzymes mm -hmm. are abundant, and most of them are natural. Uh, so most of them break down at a relatively low temperature. So once you start getting above body temperature, you're running into the risk of starting to break down single cell organisms and also their enzymes. Um, and when you're, when you're, when you have a fever, when you get sick and infected and you start to run a fever, that's your own body raising your temperature to attack the single cell organisms that are infecting you and also the enzymes that they're manufacturing to digest you. And so a pretty good rule of thumb is if you can achieve 115 degrees Fahrenheit for a relatively sustained period of time, and I'm talking a couple minutes, um, you're going to kill the, ma the vast majority of single cell organisms and their enzymes. Yes, there are exceptions. OK, but even those, um, you know, as you raise your temperature, more and more of those are going to die. Out. But there are exceptions. You know, there's uh, those uh, thermal vents in the ocean where there's bacteria and enzyme that, you know, thrive at 170 degrees Fahrenheit and all that. But but these are rare uh, compared to what normally you're going to run into. Yeah, I, I actually did a lot of research on the subject before the show, knowing that this would be an important question. And I was curious because so, so much debate happens and, you know, they run it through their hydro force. They buy a, you know, a pre-spray that says enzyme on it. And most of the cleaning effect isn't taking place within the enzymes. Um, some deodorization is happening. Some digestion is happening, but most of it is the chemicals that are put in there. That's why we just don't even bother 
It's just it's just a catchphrase to get people to buy your stuff, throwing a lot of enzymes in, on it. Now, in some odor removal, enzyme is appropriate. Um, absolutely. I'm just not pro-enzyme. I just find them to be too problematic. I mean, they're they're slow. They're painfully yeah. slow. They're, they're painfully slow, yeah. Man, um, that's you know, where a lot of people made the mistake. They get this great enzyme-based product. Enzyme and, toilet bowl and, cleaner. Did you survive they, through that? And then they would put it down, and two minutes later, they're like, hey, extracting, and it's like, whoa, it didn't work? Well, yeah, because mm -hmm. it takes time, buddy. Yeah, it, I remember enzyme <laughs> toilet bowl cleaner. We got some of that, and you would put it on the inside of the toilet rim, and you would go away, and you would come back, and you would then go to wash the toilet, and nothing would happen, and it required 18 minutes of dwell time. Now, who runs a janitorial business that allows their staff to take 18 minutes doing anything? Um, so I don't even is, take 18 <laughs> minutes to dirty the toilet. I don't know <laughs> what we're talking about here. <laughs> I'm sure it's not going to take 18 minutes to clean the damn thing. Poop. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about taking a poop. I'm not taking a poop for 18 minutes. I know some of you like to read a novel on a toilet, but that ain't me. No, you're in out and very. I'm sure you're. You're just. You're in control. How's it going to do? You got to move on yeah, to the exactly. next thing. I got. You got to move on to the next thing. You have things to do, and pooping's not on one of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's. I mean, you know, those of us that have modern employees are used to the 45 minute sabbatical, but we're not going there. The staff that's take, a 45 minute cell phone break. You're not pooping for 45 minutes. I nobody is. It's like, Look, if you're pooping for 45 minutes, you need to go see a doctor. <laughs> you might need some correct all or ex lactose I mean, diet, a little bit more fiber. More fiber, maybe, maybe just like take the thing that always got me about enzymes is when people maybe would some pre and postbiotics. Yeah, yeah, something. Post yeah, you need some probiotics in your diet so, for sure. Thomas, conversation you've been around friend, guys. You've been around the game. You're our Captain America of carpet cleaning. You know, you've been around a while. You've seen, you've been in the trenches and you've seen the fad of enzymes come. Um, what's your take on enzymes? Are I've they of value? Most of the fad go. The problem is, yeah. you know, the enzymes were very much the 80s and 90s. And then everybody got into the oxidizers. Okay. The problem with enzymes is, you know, they do have temperature limitations. They also need to stay wet for long times. Many times they have to be applied multiple times in order to work. And so when the oxy phrases hit, you know, everything's oxy this and oxy that today. But the reality is whether you're using peroxides or uh, sodium percarbonate or you're using ClO2, they're oxidizers and they're faster working. They're more dependable. They're more predictable in general, in general, than a lot of these enzymes. And a lot of times they're more cost effective as well. You don't have to reapply several times to get an effective kill. So I see a lot of the enzymes going by the wayside now and a lot of the oxidizers taking the forefront technologically. And it's, you know, it's not that they can't work. It's just that in general, it's a lot easier to use an oxidizer. I mean, just like protein stain removers. Protein stain will take out blood just like our oxidizers will. Read the oh, bottle. Absolutely. Put it on, let it dwell 15 minutes. Who's got 15 mm -hmm. minutes to take a blood spot out? I can do it in two minutes with any oxidizer. Okay. So it's a matter of convenience, <laughs> replicatable, mm -hmm. duplicatable results, et cetera, et cetera. And the oxidizers just seem to have an advantage in general over the enzyme. Now, there are specific instances for digesting raw fecal matter and things like that, where the enzyme may be the better long-term way to go. But in general, I see the oxidizers will vastly outdistance the enzymes today. Well, and now, now that the cre now that ClO2 and like products like obliterate are out, there's just, there's just no purpose. ClO2. It's not Stabilized. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and here's one thing. If you ever have somebody that's trying to sell you an enzyme-based product and they say that they have living enzymes, run the other way. They know nothing about their product. They know nothing about anything. I've literally seen, I've had salesmen come to me, We this product used living enzymes. Well, it should have you, living bacteria. 
living, living bacteria. bacteria that produce enzymes, but enzymes are not a living thing. Let's just not yes, get stupid. Here. Do you remember the Spartan enzymes that smelled kind of like tequila, Kevin? Oh yeah, yeah. I used oh a yeah, lot of Spartan stuff over the years. They they you know that's a the funny thing about Spartan. They have. I mean, everything. I it's, it's like everything. Any chemical, big chemical manufacturer, they have the middle of the road that's all the same. Everybody, every manufacturer has that middle of the road that's the same. Then they have like maybe 5% that is just killer. Nobody can touch it. And then they got like 20% that's just crap. Every Everybody's the same. I'm not picking on Spartan. I love Spartan. Me too. Spart Me I tell too. you what, if you if you really want to love Spartan, go to the ISSA show. And go to the get an invite to the Spartan party. Whew. You yeah, won't remember your I've name heard, the heard next day. Good things. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I've actually been to that. <laughs> oh, it's fun! It's fun. There is nothing like. Okay, so here's a pro tip for y'all. There is nothing like going to an open bar and tipping your bartender heavy at the beginning of the night. Oh, that's what you have to do. You will be plastered yes. within an hour because they will love you, heavy pour you, and you're just, especially if you're ordering like eight, maybe eight Long Islands that night. Yeah, you won't remember your name the next day. Yeah, that that's that. Keep in mind, guys. I don't. Kevin I'm not speaking from experience or anything. No, I always I always Kevin thought it was a doodle. Talking in fictitious terms, he was drinking shots of it's hypothetical. Um, butyl Florida greaser all night, saying that he was able to bonnet clean anything. Yeah. Um, so don't <laughs> follow that. Clean. I'm a bonnet clean with emulsifier plus. What are you talking about? Emulsifier <laughs> plus. All righty. So I think it is actually um, Josh. What is your thoughts on enzymes? We didn't catch your thoughts at all. You were muted down there, being all nice. Well, when I got in the industry, I was using. Um, which was my go-to for for about five years, um, which is mainly all know up in Michigan, and uh, they they're now not in business, correct? Well, they you're got cut, you're cutting out a little bit. What product did you use? Grease eraser. Oh, oh yes, yeah. yeah. My the guy I bought my business from. You're not saying me. it right though. It's got to be grease eraser. Grease. That stuff was amazing. Exactly. That oh, was yeah. excellent stuff. But yeah. but again, I, I'm going to interrupt you and just say what 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 Tim said is really what's true. Sometimes um, they put on the label what people want to hear, the word mm -hmm. enzyme. Yeah. But the reason that product was so good had nothing to do with the enzyme. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it was a great. It really was good stuff. Um, I'm curious. What was in it that uh, other than the enzyme? Because that stuff, um, I miss it. Well, I think Paul and I can have a conversation, maybe come up with something for you um, yeah. for those nasty restaurants that's a, the exact product to match that. It'll probably um, say enzyme on the label, though. I think we should put it on it 60 times in a sarcastic, have a sarcastic Tim face. <laughs> and a sarcastic Paul face, like a Ben and Jerry's container, and we're both going enzyme. <laughs> It'd be like a and the little Pac Man. Come on, you gotta have the yeah. little Pac Man enzyme, thing, right? enzyme. right? Ultra alive Pac super enzyme formulation six. Just keep turbo. No, it, it, it'll be charged. like Ben and Jerry's, except with Beaker and Bunsen on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a hey, look, I, look, I, everybody. I mean, tell me you can't sit here and look at a picture of Tim and a lecture, picture of Paul and tell me that's not Beaker and Bunsen right there. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. Right. Fine. You win. You win Facebook for the day. You win YouTube for the day. Congratulations, Kevin. You won the prize tonight, which equals nothing. Yeah, it is time it for us to get our last. What would you By the do, way, everybody, I finally got my uh, gallon, gallon jug of liquid obliterate. It only took like 18 years, but I finally got it. Dude, you, you yeah, kept saying I'm I could shake out your mine, gallon. Kevin, I don't want to hear it. Rub it in. I still don't have mine. Look, the, Yeah, the but see, the thing is, is Tim lives guys. 20 minutes away from me. <laughs> when you're my buddies. He could have stuck in his butt and farted I mean, and, and shipped it here. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sherry told me to bring it over to your house like several That's times. That's probably I, why I have it because your wife told you to give it to me. That's no, no, it was on the shelf of no. my van, and I had two up there. Oh, accident! <laughs> See, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I brought this for you, Kevin, and I even gave you the one I stole some out of. Exactly, he didn't even give me a whole gallon. It was like a like three ounces shy of a gallon. Kind of three <laughs> ounces shy. He weighed it right. He probably oh, I know weighed he it. used He's it because he used it. Right it he used it on my job. That's what. I yeah, know that was boring. that was sarcastic. I did use it on a job that you were paying me to do, which was amazing. By the way, that was like the most incredible moment of my life. I'm like, I'm giving him product that he's been begging for. I've been teasing him with it, and he's paying me to clean the job, and I'm giving him cleaner that I've used on that job. That's what you call friendship, right there. So, right here, speaking of what happens. To all of us cleaners, I have had this happen to me so many stinking times that I actually loaded up an Oric Orbiter so I could clean my mother-in-law's carpet while we were vacationing in Florida. So in this case, Andrew, Andrew had it happen to him. Um, you know, he had his little sickness. spotting machine and um, hit that it's carpet. So have you guys ever had anything like this happen to you where it's just like – Hey, casually fix this huge mistake for me, um, cleaning wise. While visiting friends, I don't. I don't think it's a casual mistake. I think we just see we stuff and we're right like, "Oh my it. god, I can't let this go!" And you go get something out of your truck, your van, and you're just like, "Just let me, let me, let me fix it, please. Let me fix it." Because look, <laughs> the fact is, is that we ruin people that are close mm -hmm. to us. My wife cannot go into any bathroom anywhere, anywhere without critiquing it and the first thing she do, comes out of it oh my god that that was so, that was filthy well, they usually i can't are. go anywhere That's without what... looking down at the carpet underneath my feet I can't... Carpets, yeah, floors it's windows we, can't, we look at everything at now, see this is the thing guys i know josh deals with the same affliction i've watched that man like spin on his heel to show me something wrong with tile floor in a restaurant that it was the italian restaurant that we ate at, um, at Mike, the, the hard surface class. And, you know, we're just all there. We're all having a good time. We see something wrong with the floor. We start talking about it. I have a feeling that Paul has learned how to navigate this very well. Because the second a band starts, Paul never notices anything else. Um, <laughs> Look, is you that Paul, trick, you Paul? Give Paul we just have live, music live and music? A gin and tonic, and you can light an atomic bomb off next to him, and he ain't going <laughs> to see nothing. So, um, you know, I, I taught carpet inspector school uh, for many, many years with Ed York and Richard Mitty. Um, and anytime we'd go out anywhere for dinner or other places, uh, I would s soon be staring at the floor, and my wife would say, uh, they did something wrong with the flooring, right? And I'd say, yeah, notice here. <laughs> I'd start explaining, you know, the defect in the floor covering or insulation or or, or whatever. So it is, it is a disease. Uh, I had a good friend of mine uh, that every time they went on uh, vacation, he loaded up their car with the carpet cleaning stuff. And uh, his wife wanted to visit relatives and friends, and he and he did too. You know, he wanted to spend a good couple good couple hours with those people, and then he would go out and do carpet jobs. I mean, he he he, he didn't it's he did carpet cleaning. And it's uh, almost and, like and, yeah. And Andrew, just so you know, it's incurable. <laughs> there's there's nothing that can be done. You are going to clean anything carpet related any time that you have a machine or. A chemical, you'll get a washcloth out and start spotting well, carpet. Well, Kevin, it's... Kevin, let's let's just admit it. We're I all surface cleaners. When I travel, <laughs> Tom when I go to visit so... my kids, I carry a spotting kit. Please, God, tell me Thomas has a medical note to carry a spotting kit on the airplane. <laughs> it's, it's okay, TSA. Please, Lord. I'm a carpet no, professional. No, remember, I don't fly very often because of my medical stuff. So you I don't drive fly because you can't remember. take a spotting kit. No. 
I no. drive everywhere pretty much. I know you do. I know you do. It, so. You know what, though? I have saved a wedding. I have saved a wedding with a bottle of Ultra Dry and a rag where the bride had something spill on her dress in a section they could remove. I cleaned it over on the side. And I had Ultra Dry with me. And it was a, everybody was like, what are we going to do? Well, you know, it was just plastic material that, you know, a lot of times when you see those, um, that webbing and netting that's on the outside of a wedding dress, it's not actually anything like silk or anything like that. It's just synthetic fiber. And Ultra Dry just instantly, I just misted it, took it right off and blotted it. Instantly gone. Great product. Took care of it. Boom. Saved a, saved a dear bride. Um, that was a fun experience. But, you know, I happened to have to have driven my carpet cleaning van to a wedding because I had a job that morning. At I the, wore my suit to the job. <laughs> There's no getting it out of us, guys. Look, I got, I got an award from a customer one time. <laughs> they had a big ribbon-cutting thing for their lead uh, certification. So all the big wigs were there. I was there in a suit, okay? So first of all, picture me in a suit. Did it have and sleeves? It did. Oh, At the wow. time, it did. Okay. Um, and there was the, – the floor was dirty for some reason, so I was on a riding auto scrubber in a suit. I got the award for the best dress janitor for, <laughs> for uh, Stryker Medical. It was great. Like, the, people were taking pictures here. I'm suit and tie, just oh, up, riding my Tasky around, cleaning the floor. So the the, the... – the task you did go through and maintain it afterwards. You properly rinsed out the recovery tank and greased all the zerts. That's why I had employees. I gotta go double check this. You know me and maintenance, man. You did you did put it away properly. I parked auto it. scrubbers. I parked uh, years it. and years of running auto scrubbers in the truck. Those of you that are considering floor care, don't you don't survive it and you don't come out of it well. Um, having auto scrubbers in, in trailers was one of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life and never ending breakdowns only prevented through maintenance. And that, that's one of the things we think we have it bad sometimes in our industry and we really don't. And, you know, Andrew, you did a great job. That's what we have to do. You know, we love what we do. We're passionate about what we do. And I think that's the pant point. Um, tonight's show was about relevancy. And if you look at what Kevin had to say, you know, tonight, the hard truth, truth is, is we're relevant, but we're only relevant because they're not doing it themselves. We are relevant in that aspect. So we have to find relevancy in other parts of our lives as well. And you don't want to ever discredit the fact that we're all worth something. So, um, Josh, did you have a book for us tonight? Well, I've uh, been busy, but I thought I'd bring back this one book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which we could go over multiple times. Um, but it's by Stephen R. Covey. I wanted to highlight a, a here. Um, basically, this book is about building from the inside out and uh, working on yourself. And I thought it would be good to highlight habit number five, which um, as a professional, especially when we're talking about relevancy, it's important to seek first to understand the customer and then to be understood. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what that uh, chapter is about. Let me get over here real quick. And uh, <clears throat> let's see what we've got to say here. Um, Suppose you've been having trouble with your eyes and you decide to go to an optometrist for help. After briefly listening to your complaint, he takes off his glasses and hands them to you. Put these on, he says. I've worn these those pairs of glasses for 10 years now and they really helped me. I have an extra pair at home. You can wear these. So you put them on, but it only makes the problem worse. This is terrible, explained. I can't see a thing. Well, what's wrong, he said. They work great for me. Try harder. 
I am trying, you insist. Everything is a blur. Well, that's the matter with you. What's the matter with you? Think positively. Okay. I positively can't see a thing. Boy, are you ungrateful, he chides. And after all I've done to help you, what are the chances you'd go back to that optometrist the next time you help them? Not very good. I would imagine you don't have much confidence in someone who doesn't diagnose before he or she prescribes. But how often do we diagnose before we prescribe in communication? Um, and so that's what his point is, is basically when you talk to people, it's important to listen to them first and to try to understand what, where they're coming from rather than just showing up, acting like you know it all. And sometimes you can miss golden opportunities of helping the customer. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought I'd highlight that. And that's important. Oh, when thank you. Very relevant. So, Very relevant. Yeah. It's a yep. very relevant point. And, you know, it's like um, it's like Thomas tonight talking about, you know, <clears throat> you know, the importance of not uh, of grooming, how important that is and how passionate he was about that. Well, that's the sort of passion he instills in his students toward doing things right. That's how we remain relevant. Um, so I am going to go ahead and wrap up all the time. That's relevant, you know. The most relevant thing is to do your best at all times, whether Absolutely. you're making a lot of money or you might be losing money. It, it does matter. You don't want to lose money. Don't get me wrong. But no matter what, you got to do the best job. A consummate professional is one who is a professional at all times. That's what's relevant. Mm -hmm. Do the yeah. right thing, and in the long run, it'll pay the highest dividends. And that's Absolutely. what's relevant because this is a job, and I get paid for it. And we're out here to make money. None of us are multi billionaires. And well, maybe so I, Tim is. I don't know. But, you know. No, we're hitting the tamping time brush right there. Because <laughs> Thomas is putting the smack down tonight. And I love seeing that fire in him. But Well, you know, th this, this debate goes on and on and on. And everybody wants to manby pamby around it. The reality is if the manufacturer says you're supposed to do it, if we know all the benefits of it, the only problem, the only real argument anybody has is, well, my customer is used to those marks. Well, you know what? Because someone did the wrong thing before and educated them improperly is not mm -hmm. my problem. It's my job as that consummate professional to retrain and re-educate them and do the right thing. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is if you educate the customer the right way like that, anytime somebody else, if there's ever an opportunity, let's say they, they price shopped and, and they brought somebody else in and they left those marks, now they're going to know that they actually didn't do a good job. And guess who they're going to call next time? Yeah. You. And, and something that I've learned about w when you deal with customers that want something that you know is inappropriate it's just as simple as a conversation. It doesn't, and you just, you just, it's just a simple conversation saying, look, I understand this is what so-and-so did before. That little conversation means that you're creating loyalty. You're creating reciprocity. Paul talks about that almost every week. He hasn't brought it up this week. I was thinking of making a reciprocity buzzer um, because it's so important. The communication with the customer yields reward. And if you are drawing a premium, like Kevin's rant tonight, if you're drawing a premium and you're not grooming, then you're a hack that's ripping people off. Amen. And that's it. And I'm not I'm not saying that grooming can happen on every single job in every circum single circumstances. You won't there's jobs you will not see me groom. Um like a hundred thousand square feet of carpet. That's just it, it that's commercial glue down. It's not happening. That, is there a benefit to it, to it still? Absolutely. I remember back in the day, we used to even groom looped glue down carpet. That was standard. It was considered standard. But um, it is what it is, and we all got to realize And if the customers, after you educate them, tell them they still don't want it, then it's on them. At least you've done your job as a professional and educated them. Absolutely, that's their choice. I don't. It's their money. I'll do whatever they want me to do, but I have an obligation, almost to me, a moral obligation, 
to explain what they should be getting and what they should be expecting and why it should be done properly. And if they say, hey, I don't like it that way, it's on them. It's okay then. You can go ahead and not groom. Absolutely. And I agree with Paul, too, that gin and tonics and live music, you can't really have. You don't think about the flooring very much. Um, so <laughs> flooring becomes less relevant. I'm telling you, we all need more live music in our lives. It makes and you that, happy. And alcohol. So I'm going to go through my L final Live blues in. matters. L blues matters for sure, man. So, guys, today... We're I was going to, you know, I had uh, nothing really special figured out for today's final thoughts originally, but now, now I do. And that is the importance of saving trips on jobs. Now, this is going to seem a little silly, um, but that's a Trinity Phoenix machine right there, Tops Phoenix machine. And I have everything loaded up on it. And I went ahead and I cleaned a... 5,000 square foot job with everything you see there in one trip into the building. Now, I had to walk up three paths and all, you know, it was three paths and then this, you know, up to a landing, to an elevator, to a stairwell. It was complicated. So I had to save myself trips. And that val is showing value to your time. You got to value your time. Guys, we are. Our time is very precious. You have got to value your time enough that you're not wasting trips back and forth to the truck. You're not dropping things. You're not forgetting things. Spend a little bit more time in your life thinking of what you need to do to complete a job faster so that you can spend more time with the things that are actually important. You know, this show is awesome. I love doing it. All of us on the panel all agree we love doing the show. I mean, we wouldn't be here if we didn't enjoy it. But it doesn't change the priority of the people that are close to us in our lives. You know, when you have the opportunity to help somebody that's a friend or a family member or even a neighbor or an acquaintance, that's how you remain relevant. And you want to be relevant to the people in your life or you, you will be lonely. And it's... It's not meant to be mean, but be relevant to the people in your life. Take care of them. Show them kindness. Show them consideration. Make sure that you're suiting their needs so that they can help you out when you're in despair. And um, you find people that are good to surround you and take care of you. So that isn't really advice from me. It's advice from other people, and it's from experience, something I'm going through as well. So keep that in mind, guys. Grow as a person. Be relevant to the people around you. Take care. Don't be a jerk. Remember, it's just the teacher's lounge. But we do what we can, and we take care of each other. 